Welcome to the Modern Mythos Podcast, a show dedicated to Call of Cthulhu and other investigative horror games. I'm John Hook. And I'm Seth Skorkowski, and together we're discussing writing, game mastering, and player tips, and how you can apply them to your table. In today's episode, we're going to continue our conversation about insanity and bouts of madness, uh, since that episode ended up going a very long time, and then we didn't even cover everything we wanted to. Uh, and then we we're then going to go into tips for playing online games. Yeah, insanity and bouts of insanity, bouts of madness, that is a really meaty topic and uh i was it kind of surprised me how uh how long and in depth we talked about it uh in our previous episode oh yeah we uh, originally we had planned on we were going to talk about uh that and online gaming in the in the same episode and you know about i think about 45 minutes in both of us realized like oh we had a lot more to talk about than we uh, had originally planned um so instead of cutting that one short we just figured we'd go ahead run pretty much the maximum time we can do for a podcast and then uh right i think right when we were done we realized that we hadn't even covered everything so uh we'll finish that up today and then we can talk about online gaming so john where did we leave off well really we did not cover uh the myriad of, of manias and phobias that your investigator could be uh, inflicted with should they fall to a bout of madness. You know, what does that bout of madness beyond just the immediate uh, effects, what long lasting impression would that bout of madness uh, leave on your investigator? And with with both of them, uh, we, we kind of lump a lot of them together, you know, and it a lot of stuff like, you know, phobia and mania, even though they're, they're separate entities. Uh, so, you know, a phobia is you know, clearly the, the character has an irrational fear of something. Um, and then the, the, the mania is some sort of compulsion towards yep. something. Um, and the, the book gives us lists for each. That's a hundred options long uh so there's no shortage of of interesting ones that we can we can give to our players the the problem with them being that long uh in especially in call of cthulhu which is a based off percentage dice is the natural inclination uh, and i i made this mistake of like oh we have a phobia mania let's roll percentage dice and figure out which one it is it none of them are ever close to appropriate uh, if you if you leave it completely up to chance like that. Uh, so if you uh, sample mania, uh, just grabbing one here, I am never, ever going to get to pronounce any of these correctly, but it was like an obsession <laughs> with flowers. Okay. You know, right. that's, yep. that's, a, that's a cool one. But... If the situation was a deep one, since I haven't used deep ones in all my examples, you know, a, a deep one jumps out and all of a sudden you have an obsession with flowers and there was no flowers, anything mentioned in this entire thing. That makes no damn sense. And uh, I've, I've watched uh, or read on different forums when, when players will complain of the, the Call of Cthulhu mechanic. And that's, that's one of their complaints is their, their keeper, had done that where, okay, we, we rolled a mania or a phobia, let's roll percentage dice and that's it. And then just stick to it, whether it is remotely appropriate or not. Uh, so kind of my thought on whenever I have done these, I do have the player role, but I have absolute authority because I, I'm kind of like hoping maybe there's an off chance that they do come up with something that's just crazy enough that I can link it. Uh, the total number of times that I've been able to effectively is probably like twice, <laughs> but it's, it's a, most of the time I'm like, yep, that sucks. Um, and I'll, you know, like just basically start wherever that number was and just start going down the list till I find something that, that is more appropriate unless I've just got one off the top of my head. Uh, so if you've got a, uh, a claustrophobia, okay. If, if it is a scene that is taking place in a very dark, confined 
space, claustrophobia is perfectly appropriate for it. So we could go with claustrophobia, but you know, don't, I would never suggest that a keeper just grab that table and roll and just blindly announce, you know, that's what it is, uh, such as comitromania, an obsession with cemeteries. I, I can't pronounce anything correctly. Anybody that's ever <laughs> listened to my, my YouTube or anything knows I have, I'm an, I'm an incapable of pronouncing, incapable, just more examples of pronouncing anything correctly. But you know, an obsession with cemeteries. Okay. If we were ever going with ghouls or in the cemeteries, awesome. But otherwise random, if this took place on a steamer ship and we're in the middle of the Atlantic ocean and we're on deck and a hunting horror appears, it, it's going to require some mental gymnastics to justify that one. When we could come up with much better ones. I totally agree. Yeah. One of the things that I think, and I have been totally guilty of this, is feeling the compulsion to roll and determine what that uh, phobia or mania is in during the act of the insanity portion of the game, right? You know, so your your investigator has lost about uh, you know a bunch of in. Uh, sanity points and has uh, successfully made their idea role and has now had this bout of madness and we almost always uh i mean unless it it feels uh, appropriate to invoke a particular bout of madness uh we almost always roll for those bouts of madness and then we immediately roll for the long-term phobia or mania and that is a habit I want to break. Uh, I And I want to preach it and I want to break it because... I'm right there with you. You know... Equally so guilty of that. Because, you know, because I, 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 I am 100% with you on the, you know, rolling and you end up getting that, uh, that flower obsession mania, which is the... Antho anthomania, right? So let's let's say you were encountering deep ones, and then you know you came up rolling on the mania table. You came up with the with the uh, uh, flower obsession. Now you know I agree that really doesn't seem to fit, but you could make it fit if you wanted to, if it wasn't something that you were trying to determine right then and there in the moment, because that's what the bout of madness is for. The bout of madness is for, this is what's happening to me right here, right now, as my mind is breaking. And, you know, maybe there's a combat going on. Maybe there's a chase going on. Something is happening and, you know, your character's adrenaline and probably the player's adrenaline is elevated right as they're going through this high energy episode that's causing this severe loss of sanity points but as you're coming down from that assuming you survive whatever that situation was as you're coming down from that and you're you're trying to start putting the pieces of your of your life back together you're trying to figure out and reorganize the 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 chaos that you've just lived through what if you found yourself wandering in somebody's garden you know you're in somebody's backyard and uh you've stumbled upon and wandered amongst uh all these flowers that you know these uh orchids and lilies with all these you know uh, very alien looking flower heads and, and and the 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 pestles and stems and you know all this you know the flower petals and they're all they seem to be like looking at you right and you know reaching out at you and as you're kind of coming down from that high and you're discovering yourself in this you know strange uh, world of color and texture maybe that is what uh, freaks you out and then you go running you know screaming out of this uh out of this garden with a with an intense uh you know fear or hatred of uh flowers i mean you could kind of spin that but i think as keepers we should 
break this habit where we're trying to not only roll for a bout of madness, but also roll for the long-term lasting phobia or mania all at the same time. Because if you put some distance between it and you, you know, determine that during the cool down period, you can, you know, use the table maybe as an inspiration. Because even if you rolled the flower thing, you're like, that just still seems stupid. Just pick and do something different, but save that determination for the cool down. And, and I think you hit it. What they do during that, that insanity and, and not just the bout of madness, but like the whole time they're indefinitely insane. Like what the game does after that, because you know, they've got a mania or phobia once this is done, you you can afterwards reflect on that, you know, sometime maybe between sessions, then inform them this has become the new thing for your character. This is the direction we're going to go with that. Uh, because this is a long-term uh, commitment of, of a, of a long-term change that you're going to do to the character. Because it, it's kind of hard to actually get those removed, even though you can through uh, going through therapy. So you at least want one that, that works. Uh, it, you know, Having a, a moment of something silly and goofy that doesn't really work and we'll just we'll just roll with it. You know, that's fine. But when it's a long-term change to your character, like you now have a phobia or a mania, you want to have at least enough time to have thought about it and have one that makes sense and one that we all find enjoyable and fun versus you know, I was in a I was in a subterranean cave and a, and a, and a deep one popped out and now I'm afraid of dogs. And like what what is what does that have to do with anything? But if you had that bout of madness and you watched it and they ran and they hid in a greenhouse, then afterwards you can say, you've got a mania with flowers because that's where you were safe when you saw the eye of God and the, the, the stamen of an orchid or something. And, you know, then, <laughs> and now they just, now, now they love flowers. But that was just because during the bout of madness, that was the direction the game ended up taking and sometimes as a keeper you can kind of push that direction but other most of the time you're kind of responding to what the player is doing and i think it's a lot cooler if the player you know goes these directions as their character is going insane and you you let the unpredictability of the game happen and from that you then choose what it's going to be now in the the, the mechanics wise if a character has a phobia, such as you know a fear of dogs or, what, or whatever, and they're sane, it has no mechanical effect at all outside of roleplay. Uh, so if, if a character is arachnophobic and you throw a spider against them, just you know a normal spider, not a monstrous alien spider that's just them to role play the fact that their their character is always supposed to be afraid of spiders but we don't do any mechanics now if they are going through insanity and they come across a spider uh really that's that's a penalty die in order to pass the spider <laughs> or you know or or get beyond whatever it is. So if they're claustrophobic, but they know that they have to get in an elevator and go up to the top floor of this building, and they don't want to be in that tiny little elevator because they're claustrophobic, it would, it would give them a penalty die as long as they're in the elevator or whatever the source of their, their phobia is. And a lot of the older scenarios that I've read love pulling out sanity checks for characters that have certain phobias. Um, you know, where like, and then the, 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 the door to the mausoleum shuts on them and any of the characters that have, you know, these three phobias, you know, such as claustrophobia or fear of tombs or whatnot, like need to make a sanity check or they lose that. And, and that actually gave me a very wrong impression of Call of Cthulhu because I was reading, you know, second or third edition and I'm playing seventh and I, I had not realized that that really wasn't how it was done anymore. I am fine with making them roll and giving them possibly some of that jump scare stuff that we talked about earlier, but that's more of a, 
you might they might just have the involuntary reaction. I don't even know if I'd remove sanity for that, but I might have them do the involuntary like cry out, drop their flashlight sort of thing and nothing more. Uh, or I might do the penalty die or I might just tell them to role play it. You know, it depends on the situation. But if they are insane, yeah, they're going to have penalty die till they get out of that tomb. And I, I think another area that a lot of people do get wrong is they treat the fact that they have a mania or phobia like it is always debilitating to them. Mm-hmm. Yep. People people in, in the real world have plenty of manias and phobias and are fully functional. So it, it should only, as you said, be a penalty die or uh, debilitate the investigator when it is appropriate for the for the adventure appropriate for the story when the dramatic tension is going to heighten the uh, the intensity of the game yeah and you know sometimes you might just need to like you know have you know go through with fear of a long enough game like, like remind me again where all your phobias and manias are so mm-hmm. you know, we, we can role play this so the player remembers and the the keeper can remember but for most of the time, it's it's just a role play tool. So that way, when yeah. they do go in the elevator, if they're perfectly sane, they can talk about like, oh, yeah, yeah, like you could tell that I really want to get out of this thing. Or they might be like, hey, guys, I'm going to take the stairs. Mm, right, right. Yep. And the keeper didn't tell them to do that. There's no mechanical game reason that their character would be would be better off if they took the stairs. But if the player is role playing it, that's that's what they're expected to do is to act that way. Either I get in the elevator and you can tell I'm I'm a little uncomfortable, or I'm, hey guys, I'm just going to take the stairs and and go up. That's just that's just fun role play. Yeah. Versus making them make a sand check just to force themselves in the elevator on a on a given Wednesday or something. No, that's that's getting too much into to game crunch and forgetting the role play aspect. You know, in fact, I, I've had issues where I've had to uh, uh, dial back the players where they're they're taking it to the nth degree, and I'm like, it, 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 you don't have to take it that far. You know, yeah, you've got to fear heights, but you know, right now you're not near the window. You, you you're going to be fine. You're you're fine in the in the building as is. You know. You know, as long as you don't, you know, go out on the on the balcony and really lean against the railing and try and start, you know, leaning over the railing, yeah, you know, you're going to be fine. You know, you don't need to 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 penalize yourself, um, or you know, because players will ask, you know, oh, should I be taking a penalty die on this, or uh, am I too afraid to even do this? I do I even go in that room because it has windows? Yes you're fine. You can go into the room, you know? So, uh, players enjoy, I think I keep finding players that just love, uh, doing the the opportunity to role play and, and just, you know, take it to the max, you know, whatever their, their, uh, phobia or mania is. My, my impression is, is yes. If there is, if they're not required to, like, it's kind of like, you know, if, if you tell them you, you have to do it this way, they will resent it. Mm-hmm. But if you if you give it as like, hey, this is just an opportunity to role play. If you don't if you don't do it, I'm not gonna I'm not I'm not gonna penalize you. So when they when they can see it as a you know extracurricular thing, they're they're much the same people can be a lot more excited to role play. Oh, we're in the top floor of this, this hotel or whatever. I'm gonna be real nervous. I'm gonna be avoiding the windows and whatnot. At that point, that's just the player getting into role playing. But that same player would probably grumble and gnash their teeth if if you as the keeper forced them to have to make rolls in order to navigate this upper floor of a high rise and not get near the window uh, because they feel like they're kind of being, you know, railroaded into something that I want. So I think if it's really just presented to them as this is purely role play, unless we're going through insanity. And if we're going through insanity, the worst you're going to have to deal with is this penalty dice on it. Uh, I think they can get a lot more excited to jump in on that. Agreed. Totally agree. You know, more than just call of Cthulhu, 
uses a uh, a sanity system. Uh, yeah. There there are several games that that will you know allow the players to track their mental health and uh, and have an effect on the game. One of my favorites, which I really I'm, I'm trying to find time to to get this game to the table more often is uh, Yellow King. Have you played Yellow King? I have not, but I love the Yellow King mythology. So if you ever want to do it online, give me a shout. I will. I will. Well, you know I like the Yellow King mythology. You've read Ashes of Onyx, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I've never played. You've shown me the books, but I don't I don't know anything beyond that. It's so cool. You know, it's it's based on the gumshoe system. So, you know, the uh, Trail of Cthulhu and uh, Fear Itself, that kind of thing. But it is a modified version of uh, Gumshoe. Um, and I believe uh, Cthulhu Confidential, which is uh, the one-on-one -on -one system that they use as well, one keeper, one player, it uses this similar modified Gumshoe. So with this modified Gumshoe, physical damage and mental damage are tracked with cards which are you know text states of of how that uh character is affected so it, you're not tracking uh points you're not losing hit points and you're not losing sanity or stability uh points oh quick shock i knew it would come to me so it's called the quick shock gumshoe quick shock try and say that three times real fast <laughs> So with this quick shock system, as you're playing, um, if you take mental damage, depending upon what the situation is, the the narrative of the adventure will tell you if this monster, you know, or this opponent that you're uh, fighting against, depending upon how the die roll results for the conflict, you'll either get this or this, right? And and so maybe you know, one side of the of the equation is nothing, right? And the other side of the equation is you get this card, and they actually will name the card. And all of these gumshoe or all of these uh, yellow king scenarios uh, provide a a list, you know, a, a set of the cards that are for that scenario. And they have a whole bunch that are also kind of, if you will, generic to. Uh, the game system itself, and uh, and I've I've got a whole bunch of them of these cards, and so if that if that card comes up, you know you if you were sitting at a table with you know your players live, you would take that card and physically hand that card to the player and say, okay, this condition is now on you because all these cards are are conditions, whether it's a physical injury or a mental injury, and the card will tell you how to uh, alleviate that condition. And it's neat because some of these conditions, they downgrade to a lighter condition. Mm. It depends upon how severe the, uh, the attack was that you, that you were damaged, you know, mentally damaged. You might end up getting a card that is, it's pretty heavy duty. It's got a lot of, of debilitating conditions to it. And it'll tell you, after a certain amount of time has passed in and the game itself, because I, I don't want to go too deep into the game, but the game itself, uh, it, it, it has like phases of time. And so it'll say on the card, you know, after, you know, this phase or whatever has ended or at the beginning of the next phase, you may attempt this particular skill roll. And if you succeed at it, you can downgrade this card to this uh, shock because the, the mental injuries are called shocks. And so you can just keep downgrading it based upon the conditions that are written on the card. Uh, and uh, the way that your character is either um, killed if they take uh, enough physical injury cards or driven insane if they take enough uh, shock cards is, uh, is three. Three is the magic number. Mm -hmm. So if you get three of any one condition, then you are either insane by having three shock or you are dead if you have three injury. The, the physical ones are called injury. So it is possible to have the full house of two and two 
right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you just want to, you know, at that point, you're trying to keep your character as safe as you can, you know, make those skill rolls when appropriate to try and keep downgrading, you know, either downgrading your physical injury cards or downgrading your mental shock cards so that you can finally have that, you know, buffer space of, of having, you know, not being on the cusp of having a third card of that type, you know, but, uh, yeah, Yellow King has a very interesting insanity system by these cards. And so that's that quick shock uh, gumshoe system. That's neat. Um, yeah, the other games I've, ex I've experienced with, I haven't played much of it, but I've read it and I had like played another game of it, was uh, as Delta Green, which started as Call of Cthulhu and then spun off do its own game. So they've got, they're very similar in a lot of ways. And one of the things that I liked about Delta Green when it came to this is your character has uh, certain relationships with people. Uh, so when you're making your character, you've got uh, different NPCs that you have a relationship with and they have a certain value. So if like they're a really strong relationship, they have a value of four or something. And as your character is enduring their, their mental traumas, one of the ways that they can pull through it is to basically use their uh, relationships as a way to kind of ground themselves. The problem is the, the value of that relationship downgrades. And the idea being, as your character is losing sanity or stability, their relationships with people are beginning to frazzle. And, and I think that's a really cool way to reflect how uh, when somebody is going through just some horrible mental issue, they do start isolating. They're, all the people that were valuable to them slowly become less valuable because the, the character is basically sacrificing that in order to uh, stick around. And I think that's that's a really neat way of doing it. And it also encourages role play because it now means we've got these this many other characters that we can uh, operate with. Well, in Call of Cthulhu, we do have the most valuable person, but that's more of a way that after the game's done, we can use to recover sanity in some way. This is a way you can actually kind of keep it in the game, uh, in the action to stay in the fight uh, where you you know, summon your will to, to live or to fight on by drawing upon this relationship to keep, uh, you know, yourself motivated. And another game that we, that we've been playing that has something, uh, dealing with relationships has been cult divinity lost. And in that game, uh, which is a very different animal, uh, a character's relationship with NPCs, one, can be very traumatic to them if some danger happens to the NPC, but they can recover sanity a lot better. Um, they don't have to just be NPCs, they can be PCs by talking to each other and, and basically talking each other through whatever the trauma is. And in that game, when a character finally reaches the, the bottom level of their stability, as they go, they go through different thresholds and the, the different ones could be, it becomes harder for them to do what's called to keep it together, which is essentially their sanity save. So the, the lower you get, the harder it is to keep it together. Makes sense. And each character has disadvantages. So the lower it gets, the harder it gets for them to succeed to uh, and overcome their disadvantage roles, which also makes sense. Their, their, uh, their disadvantages are becoming harder to avoid. But once they get to the bottom of that, um, to the level that's like basically called like unhinged, their ability to what's called see through the illusion, to see the truth of the world actually gets better uh, <laughs> because they're, they're so insane that the, the fact that the, the, you know, all this weirdness going on around them, they can now navigate that a lot better. So it'd be kind of like if your character's insane, you get a bonus die to your mythos checks because you are at a level of like, wait, no, now that, now that I'm at a level of, I am unhinged, I can irrationally make order out of all of this in, in a way my sane mind couldn't. 
And also on that one, once you hit the, the bottom level, you're totally at zero and it's what they call broken. It's not the end of your character. It just means some fundamental shift has happened, which could include um, them actually getting an experience point. And experience points in that game are rare. Like, you know, <laughs> if, if you have a badass, flawless game, you get five. Uh, so they're, they're, they're like gold. But you can basically have an insight where you can get one. But something about your character will permanently change due to that. But it's not it's not going to result in your your loss of your character. So I do like the fact that we can use uh, these other characters to help keep keep ourselves sane or to recover a lot faster. But at the same time, if something bad happens to them, it's even worse because whatever your value of relationship to them is, you lose twice as many if they're in danger or killed. So if you have the other PCs become very valuable to you and you give them a high point value because they can heal you in the field, if something bad happens to them, it's twice as bad now because, it, and you did that to yourself. And, and I think it's a really cool give and take on that one. And it really has encouraged a lot of role play with it. So I've, I don't know, I've, I've enjoyed that. And I think both of those games really heightens relationships. Um, yeah, yeah. At, as as the key thing, and ultimately, we do want a game that's fun. We've got the horror aspect, and I think pulling in those NPC relationships or the relationships between the PCs is very critical uh, to make that the sanity feel more personal and 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 real. And that's one of the things I've been trying to kind of work more into my Call of Cthulhu games since I've played these others is to be aware of different ways we can interpret that and use those to our advantage uh, just for a better game and to make that character feel more real to us and those NPCs to feel more real to us versus just a name that's on a character sheet that they wrote in there because they had to write something. So, You know, you just mentioned about how as you spiral down enough, you actually get better at, um, you know, seeing the, the world and being able to, uh, interact with the insanity of the world. Right. Um, there is a, another game that I really enjoy that also has a, uh, a mental stability mechanic and it also, um, uh, seamlessly assists the player in, and getting better at doing things. And that's the alien role-playing game. Oh, yeah. Free League. You know, the alien role-playing game is a is a dice pool game. And so when you're rolling your skills, you're throwing a pool of D6s. And um, and just the six is a success. Not, not anything else on it. It's just the six. And really... Under most circumstances, you only need the one, just one of those dice in your pool to come up with a six. And if you get more than one, you're able to apply what they call in the game stunts, right? So maybe you're applying extra damage or you're doing it faster, you're doing it with flair, or you can also in the game, you can, you can kind of pocket a, a future success, you know, for that exact same skill, right? So, you know, if I get a six and I, I don't need all of the sixes that I rolled, I can take one of them, put it in my pocket. And then the next time I have to run that exact type of skill, I can pull that out of my pocket and, and pre-apply it and say, I'm about to roll this pool of dice, but I've already got one success going into it because of a previous uh, successful roll. Well, when your characters start confronting the horrors in the in the uh, that exist in the alien universe, you start collecting uh, stress points, and stress points are also uh, equated to stress dice. So every point of stress that you have is also an additional stress die that you add to your pool and the cool thing about it you know because when you're rolling your regular base dice as i said only the number six is what you're looking for and it is a success yeah so you've got a, a pool of four die 
You just need one of those four die to hit a six. And yeah, and it, and it doesn't matter what the other dice come up with, be it a, a, a two or a three or a one, it doesn't matter. But now that you're starting to accumulate stress and you're gaining stress points, and each one of those stress points is also a stress die, now when you're trying to do a skill test, you calculate the number of, of uh, regular base dice or skill dice that you're going to roll to to do that test. But now you also add in all of your stress dice that you've accumulated via your stress points. Okay, so if I've got a pool of four normally and I have a stress of three, I now roll seven die. Right. And the game, um, either you... You buy their game dice because they come in two colors, or you just have your own dice and make sure that they're in two different colors or two different sizes or, you know, styled differently. But you want to be able to, at a glance, be able to say, okay, these are my skill dice and these are my stress dice. And uh, so when you throw your pool, you are still looking for sixes. And even your stress dice, if they come up a six, that's awesome because it's adding, it's increasing the pool of dice that you're rolling, thus increasing your odds of having one or more successes. But now with the stress dice, you do have to be cognizant of the other dice facing that comes up because on a stress die, if you get the inverse, if you get a one, that is bad. If you get a one, you are now going to be panicking. So once again, if I've got a pool of four and I've got yep. a stress of three, I roll seven die. Yep. Any of those hit a six, I succeed. Yep. But if those th you know, three stress dies, any of those come up with a one on their face, we panic. Exactly. And the, uh, the other thing I should probably mention is that with the panicking, it's uh, one or more. It is not... Uh, oh, I rolled two ones. That doesn't matter. The fact is that you had one or more uh, ones on your stress dice. So if they all come up ones, it's no different than if one of them came Correct. up with one. Yep. Okay. In, in your example, if all three of those stress dice came up as ones, it's no different than if only one of them came up as a one. Uh, so now that you've panicked, now you have to roll on the panic table. And the panic table is a, is a pretty cool table. And uh, you just roll a single D6 and add your current stress point value. So you roll a D6 and you know maybe you roll a 3. And if your current stress level is a 3, 3 plus 3 is 6. So then you check the panic table and see what a 6 is. Uh, results as, and you start applying that to your uh, character. And as the numbers get higher, the panicking gets more potent. Uh, and if you get above a 10, if you get a result of a 10 or higher, that will actually negate any successes that you had because it is possible in Alien to have a successful skill roll and still panic as long as your panic wasn't too severe. So a nine or less. Okay. So if, uh, so you you roll a D six, add your stress level and that's the, the rank we had. So nine or less means if our total stress is, uh, three, where the highest we could ever get is nine. We we could still succeed. So we're we're panicking. It's improving our chance of success, but we're not going to ultimately fail our our task because we're panicking so hard. So right, this game Alien does have a real spiral, downward spiral with panic if you start accumulating too many stress points. Because there, there is like a sweet spot of, I'd say anywhere from one to four stress points is manageable. But you start getting more than four stress points, you really need to start figuring out how are you going to calm down. And oh, they yeah. have they have mechanics for that as well. 
one of the skills that every character has is called command. And uh, it doesn't matter if you're character occupation is one of an officer or not um and and while officer characters typically do have a higher command skill any character can have a command presence a commanding presence right you know so they can uh use and leverage that command uh skill in benefit of a player who is um stressing out right they've got a lot of stress so if a character has rolled on the panic table and they're freaking out you know maybe they have a a nervous twitch going on and if you have a nervous twitch uh one of the things that uh, happens is that uh well nervous twitch is is not bad because it doesn't affect you as a player it does actually negatively affect your your fellow companions but uh let's say they start panicking because you're getting so twitchy yeah your your fellow companions they their panic their stress levels increase because they see you freaking out and they're like dude you're freaking me out you need to calm down uh but let's say you gain a tremble right now your hand is shaking uncontrollably um and you're going to start suffering a minus two penalty on your dice pool a, a fellow character, a fellow companion can come up to you and attempt to do a command skill where basically they're just trying to talk you down, motivate you, and just kind of, you know, get your shit right. And if they have a successful command skill, then they're able to negate the uh, the current uh, panic situation. So... You had that tremble in your hand. Well, now it's subsided and you no longer have that minus two penalty. I love the alien system in the sense that the, the idea that a little bit of panic, uh, actually it, it improves your, your chance of success. Right. Overall. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, it's kind of the, uh, you know, I, you always do your best studying when you're trying to cram because you panic to the last minute. <laughs> uh, right. it, it, sort of deal you know that that little bit of adrenaline um can help but it when it does actually get to a point where the the risk of it going south on you you know there's, there's kind of that, that give and take balance uh, i absolutely love the way that they do that and i love the the fact that it is a game that includes uh, a, a rule talking about everyone else's stability is getting worse because of you. Mm -hmm. uh, so in Call of Cthulhu, you know, if, if, uh, if, if the monster jumps out or, or whatever, and one of the characters is going through a, a temporary insanity or about a madness, that doesn't actually affect any of the other characters. So I, I like the fact that if a character is going through their temporary or indefinite insanity, that that starts affecting everyone around them, like that that they are kind of hurting the group's morale or the group's stability because they know that so and so is just right on the edge, and and they can they can see that. Um, and I mean, Alien did a very elegant way of of making all of that feel like you're in an aliens movie um that you know which was their goal and i think they absolutely nailed oh that absolutely goal absolutely flawlessly so uh, yeah the the panic role is very much the bout of madness in call of cthulhu okay and you know the the panic table as i said you know you you roll 1d6 plus your current stress level and the table is actually ranked from 1 to 15. And with 15, it's it just says 15 plus. So if you get anything above a 15, it'll always just be uh, the, the value of 15, which is uh, catatonic, right? Uh, you yeah, just it collapse. It doesn't get much floor. worse. Yeah, it doesn't get any worse. But I mean, the, after that, the, it just stops. <laughs> yeah, it just stops. But the cool thing is uh, on this panic table is if you end up rolling a value of 13 or higher, so near at the top of this table, if you get a 13 or higher, that's when you get a permanent mental trauma. And, and it's not a guarantee. It, it's a possibility. If you get a 13 or higher, you could 
develop a permanent mental trauma. And this is a mechanic that feels like it was taken directly from Call of Cthulhu because in Alien, what your character does is it roll, it, you make an empathy roll, which is basically like making an idea roll, right? And what happens in Call of Cthulhu is when you're making those idea rolls, that's the role you want to fail. Mm -hmm. That's the exact same thing in, in Alien. In Alien, if you get a 13 or higher on your panic roll, you make an empathy roll. And if you succeed on your empathy roll, like succeeding on your idea roll, if you succeed on your on your empathy roll, that's when you gain a permanent mental trauma. And uh, and it's a cool, it's a short little table. It's only a D6 table, but it's got, th you roll on that and you find out things like you gain a phobia or you become an alcoholic or you're suffering from nightmares or you have uh, debilitating depression, you develop drug habit, right? You get, you get into drugs or, um, oh, here's my my new favorite amnesia you can gain amnesia <laughs> god once again what a horrible way to, to <laughs> learn how to role play that yeah alien is such an awesome fun game and it's 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 such a funny coincidence that as we're recording this uh free league uh, announced the new campaign coming out called uh, heart of darkness I, I, so. I saw that uh, announcement and yeah, I'll check it out. I've, I've got a uh, destroyer of worlds. Uh, that's one that I'm kind of keeping the pipe. I would like to try to get some of us to play that in person. So, you know, we've, mm -hmm. we've never, I never wanted to play that one online because it's got all those maps because they, I got the box set and it's like, I don't want to do this online. I've got all this cool stuff and I got the yeah. cards. Yeah, yeah. Like, like I want I want to do this. In, in, in the flesh with everybody around the table uh, versus trying to get that one to work online. Uh, it, it, I don't, I don't know how well I could do that as a campaign game, but as, as one shots, their cinematic scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I don't think you could make a game that could capture the feel of an alien movie more perfectly uh, than that one has. Uh, I agree. Hyper impressed. Um, but um, I think that actually helps us segue into our other topic here. I agree. Which is online playing. Something that I had barely done prior to two years ago, uh, with the exception of after I'd started the channel, uh, my YouTube channel, I'd gotten invited to uh, Into the Darkness and some different uh, podcast uh, play games. And that I would join in, you know, part of that, you know, it's just my friends. We just meet and hang out and play and in the past two years. I think I have, uh, clocked quite a number of hours, uh, doing online gaming. So this is something that I don't know you, I get asked about a lot. You see a lot of questions on the different forums about, uh, what makes it different and everything like that. So which John, you and I, we have only ever played online together that's true that's so, true uh, which we need to do more of yeah well you've been you've been teasing me with a code i think since episode one of this podcast I, <laughs> we're gonna make it happen and um but we will finally hopefully get to play together uh later this year at chaosium con yep so that should hopefully uh we need to we need to sit on a table together and um and and play and like just two dorks playing together i think that could be fun <laughs> it will be it'll be awesome yeah online play is is just exploding it's it's become a a real uh business and a and a major factor in this hobby now oh yeah well i mean you've got uh you know things like uh um, fantasy grounds where a lot of the books and everything are now available, uh, through that. Uh, and, and a lot of those, a lot of the roll 20, roll yeah. 20, which, uh, that's what I use. And I only use it because I think the, the games that whenever I'd get invited to play them, they always used roll 20. So I made an account. And when I had to start running a game, I used roll 20 cause I had an account already. 
Uh, so, and I've, I've played on fantasy grounds uh, that was being run by another GM when he's like, this is what I use. I'm like, okay, well, I got to make a login. I got to, you know, figure out how to get into this game uh, system now. But uh, there's a lot of misconceptions that it's, I don't know, the same uh, type of experience, even when it's the same people playing the same game. And I have found that to not be the case at, at all. Um, in fact, this, until you know, my, my players and I, we had gotten vaccinated, we got to finally sit in the room together. Uh, every, I think every single session we had over the time we were separate, it was like, oh my God, I can't wait till we're all in the freaking room together. I, I, you know, we, uh, we did not do well online. We, we did it out of necessity, but um, we, we realized that a lot of uh, our habits and everything that we had done by playing together, we, we couldn't do online. Um, for example, we do marathon games. Uh, so usually like once a month, we get together, it starts at noon, and it runs till 10-ish. Uh, yeah, awesome. Maybe nine, maybe midnight, you know, you know, but there's always a little break for food and all that stuff in there. Um, but we found when we were doing it online that we, our stamina was about half of that. Um, and then we all started puttering out a lot faster and we had to, uh, schedule breaks, uh, about twice as many as we normally did. In fact, we tried to get one on the top of every hour. If we, if we can pull it off, you know, sometimes you're, you might be in a scene that you can't just kill it because we happen to hit the top of the hour, but we try to get regular breaks in just to get everybody up and moving. Uh, just because because we'll start petering out if, if we don't have very, very common regular breaks, because, you know, in, when you're playing in your living room, your, your, your house or something, and, and, and Bob wants to like go grab a Dr. Pepper out of the fridge and you're talking with, you know, Gary, Bob can just kind of like hold up his finger, be like, hey, you know, kind of like that. I'll be right back gesture, get up, step in the other room, open up the fridge, grab a Dr. Pepper, come back and have not missed anything. He can hear what's going on. And, uh, but, but he just, he just tucked out and grabbed something and came back. But when you're on a screen together, all you see is that person might just leave. You, they might not be able to hear you because of headphones. You don't know when they're coming back. You don't know what's going on. Yep. Uh, and, or, you know, sometimes we'll just have somebody hold up a finger and it's like, yeah, I'm going to take a quick whiz. Uh, we can either pause or just keep going. But whenever we're playing online, everybody's kind of captive to their computer. Uh, so we actually have to, you know, official schedule breaks very, very, very regularly, uh, which that was one habit we had to learn kind of the hard way. And uh, the other one that I've realized is it, when you're online, I, I have a, uh, you know, I don't like take their phones away, but I do have a, you're not, you know, don't be on your phone during my game. We, we all kind of frown on that. Right. When you're uh, playing in person. When you're playing in person, you know, yeah. you know uh, but you know, everybody's got kids, there's business owners. I mean, they need to have a way for everybody to get a hold of them. So I'm not going to be like, keep it in the other room sort of thing, but if, if somebody pulls up the phone, one of what's kind of quick could be like, is there a problem? Is there something wrong? Cause you know, there has to be something wrong for you to have your phone out. But when you're playing online and they've got a computer screen in front of them, it becomes just so tempting for people to covertly open up that window and right. uh, start surfing the web. You know, maybe they don't, maybe people notice, maybe they don't, but now they're not paying attention. Yep. Uh, and that has become a lot harder. It's part of the reason we have to do breaks is to keep people from uh, zoning out and trying to covertly tweet or, or some crap like that. So that's that's also been a, uh, a wrestling match. Is uh, it, 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 It's such a distraction zone. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, and I've noticed that too in, in the games that I play. People will sometimes they're they're just blatant about it you know they'll end up picking up their cell phone and so it get you know we can see on camera uh if we're using a camera that they're that they're uh you know uh goofing around on their cell phone or you know like you said you're on the you're on your computer you're on your laptop you're you know the screen is right there you're they're able to uh uh to start drifting around and and 
And that's really only noticeable if you are playing with cameras. If you're not playing with cameras, you're going uh, audio only. It's the Wild West, right? I mean, oh, yeah. it, you, you know, the the players, you know, they start doing what they do in regular life, which is, well, I'm going to, you know, keep an ear out for if I hear my name, but uh, I may as well use this time to check and see if I can get a, you know, buy that thing I saw that was on sale. So yeah, I'm going to hunt eBay for, you know, something. Yeah. Um, now with audio only, um, one of the, the problems that I have, so I'll get to technical issues in a bit, but I have one player who constantly has, technical issues where he is the internet just sucks and uh, sometimes video will start kind of clogging up and it gives him connection issues so he'll often do audio only and one of the problems is he's one of those people of like you're like okay so you you go in the room and you find this and you know what do you do or you know can you give me a role and he's very quiet and as he's kind of processing this but he's he's so quiet for so long that the rest of us are camera. You can see us all kind of looking at each other like, did we lose him? We don't even know if he's, <laughs> right. he's there. Because all he has to do is at least give some sort of verbal grunt or something to to assure us that he heard us. Mm-hmm. Uh, because a, a couple of times I was like, okay, hey, can you make a skill check for this? And it'll be silent. And you kind of sit there for a second. You're probably like, hey, uh, did, did you hear me? And he just kind of says, like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I got it. And it, it's because I don't think he realizes that since he's audio only, if he doesn't make a noise, I have no idea if he's even there. Uh, like, did he dis- get disconnected? Is his is his daughter distracting him? Is uh, Did he just not hear me? I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I, uh, I think of it as the audio equivalent of talking with your hands, right? You need to do that thing where you kind of, you know, uh, talk to yourself as you're meditating or, you know, contemplating what's going on or you're, you know, fishing out the dice or whatever it is that you're going to be doing. Go, okay, okay, skill test. He said, oh, I need to. Uh, and then maybe, you know, go, hey, is this what the penalty die? Oh, yeah, what am I doing here? And, okay, oh, yeah. let's go. Uh, Mama needs a new pair of shoes. And, you know, do something. Yeah. You got to do that audio version of, you know, talking with your hands so people know what's going yeah. on. You know, talk me through the fact that you're trying to figure out where your other D10 is. Uh, like, <laughs> right. Uh, and and then that's a lot of times what it is, is he's looking down his dice. He's trying to figure out which two dice he wants to roll, double check in a sheet, blah, blah, blah. Well, he's actively playing. But since I don't have any visual, I don't know that. And, and it, it actually kind of like, because it pulls this weird steam out of the games you're trying to verify. Yeah. Um, one of the other issues that I hate about online gaming is we're all we're all connected to each other through the speakers so essentially we're all on the same channel um, talking to each other and when we're playing in person there can be little side conversations going on you know if like the the game master is talking to so-and-so while these two people are over here maybe whispering about what it is they plan on doing or what their their plans are or one of them's got a rules question the other's helping them with it or or whatnot so you know, the, the game master can be engaged with somebody and all the other players at the table are still engaged, but through these kind of little side, you know, conversations or comments, maybe whispering to each other, like, I think we should do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but when we're all on the same channel, it's kind of, you're kind of reduced to one person talking at a time. And that has probably been the most painful aspect for me. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. Especially, it doesn't have to just be side conversations, you know, vocal conversations. It, it's it's the guy who has the mechanical keyboard because he loves the click clack of the keystrokes. And feeling, feeling real called out here right now. <laughs> <laughs> I just got a brand new mechanical keyboard because my old one finally died. You're trying to have a conversation, you're trying to run a scene, and two players are trying to be respectful by just having text messaging with each other in order to not be vocal on their mics. But, you know, that one guy with the mechanical keyboard is, you know, tack, 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 tack. And then you got to stop and go, dude, Todd, mute your mic. I, uh, 
one of the other things we've had when it's come to side conversations is so we, we play on roll 20 but uh the roll 20s audio uh channels are just abysmal uh so we actually do all of the the audio video through discord um and we normally have like just a chat going throughout the week on like telegram so if somebody wants to message something i never know if they're going to message it on roll 20 on discord or on telegram so more than once uh even when i've said can we please use roll 20 because i've already got it up and mm -hmm. that's just along the side uh so i'll see it some of the like, hey did you get my message no mm -hmm. like oh yeah it is like dude you're making me actually have to open up other windows just to like to, to see this you have so there's so many options of ways they can like i've told them multiple times but it, it always comes down to each of them has their preferred one and they only remember me uh they they somehow all remember I told him to use that one uh, because that's their favorite. And even then, it's it's not as you know, typing it out isn't as much fun. It's kind of whispering to your body, like I think we should go to the lighthouse next, or I bet oh, I, think yeah. this, I think this is the bad guy. Um, now another one with these, and you know, I know it's a lot of the online games. I mean, I'm trying not to sound too much like old man yells at clouds. Is <laughs> um, a lot of them have really cool features where they have. Uh, linked everything through a character sheet and you do the online dice roll and you say like, I want to do a, uh, a skill test for, you know, shoot my gun and you click that and it does everything for you. And it just tells you if you, if you passed or failed. And I think that's really cool. I also yeah. hate it. I, uh, yes. I absolutely hate it. And uh, for example, some, one of the games I, I've, I've played uh, that I wasn't familiar too much with. So I got to play uh, Delta Green with some guys, real experience. Our, um, our handler was so excited. He built all the character sheets in there. It, it, tons and tons and tons of prep. So whenever we did skill checks, you just click the skill, it rolled it for you. The problem is I never learned the game because the, the computer did all that for me that I never got to make those mental links of, I look here, I look here, and this is how I get my result mm -hmm. because the, the system just kind of popped up pass. And I was like, Oh, okay. And even though I might on an intellectual way know how it works, I think playing over and over like make a skill check and your eyes go here and your eyes go here and you roll the dice and you you figure out if that works in your head um works so players um I've, I've noticed a trend are having a lot of trouble learning certain systems because the the system the 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 online virtual tabletop is doing it all for them and they never kind of develop that foundation of understanding fully how the rules work together and yeah. i think one of the problems is um and this might come back down to like the old school D, &D player in me is I, I i want my players to know the system and i want to know the system as a player because that's how you can like basically squeeze the maximum amount of pain out of that thing because you know how to uh how to, how to work it in a way like I know this is a way i can give myself a, an advantage or i can give myself um, you know, the best advantage I can is because I know these rules, but if, if the game's doing it for you, it's kind of like, I don't remember phone numbers anymore because my phone remembers it for me. You know, absolutely. I, absolutely. So step one to learning a new role-playing game is make a character. Step two of learning a new role-playing game is use that character sheet as a tool to interface with the game itself. So when your game master is asking you to uh, do certain actions, right? Uh, because, you know, and I'm talking about games, the predominant, you know, amount of games that use dice to resolve uh, questionable conflicts or questionable results, you know? But you don't just simply roll the dice. You're rolling the dice and, and applying it or modifying the dice roll from something on your character sheet. And there is there is a learning curve 
whether you're aware of it or not, that as a player, especially if you're new to the game, when you when you throw those bones and then you look at your character sheet and you figure out if what you did was a success or a failure, you are learning the game and becoming better at it. Yeah. But if you take that away and just becomes a button click, just like you said, and it just says pass or fail on the screen, you just have to shrug and go, okay, I guess that was right. You know, and I, I don't know. And maybe again, old man yelling at clouds. I feel like you're, you're losing uh, a, a, one of the elements that is fundamental and, and just, you know, the fun in fundamental of that role-playing game. Yeah. And uh, yeah, some, some of the other features about it, I think are like, you know, cool. I love I love the ones where if they move across a board, you can see shadows moving, uh, the dynamic lighting, and all that. Uh, my only problem is every time we've ever tried to use that, I always have at least one player who has the technical issues um, where we've had to disable that because of some glitch or or something like that you know i think it's neat um, in a lot of ways um i think it can enhance the game in other ways i think it's getting borderline to video gamey uh yeah but overall i think it's really cool um now with our group we don't use the online dice roller uh my my regular joke is that i think online dice rollers are taking us one step closer to skynet and the terminators to killing us all <laughs> so i don't trust them um, I, some of the guys I played with online fully agree with me that roll 20 personally hates me because they asked me to roll online dice on, on roll 20 when we're doing, um, uh, the, how we roll a uh, podcast. And so the series have watched me just fail and fail and fail. Like we played rune quest and like there are a whole game of rune quest. I never rolled lower than an 85 that the whole damn thing, uh, just because Roll twenty hates my guts. I'm convinced of it. It's it's sentient and it is personal and it dislikes me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, it, it's funny because I'm also in a in a game uh, that's just starting with the how we roll uh, crew. We're actually playing Alien, um, and the players are all using an online uh, dice roller from Discord. Uh, but I'm throwing real bones. I just I won't use the the online roller. I, I would rather roll real dice. You yeah, know? and me because I'm playing with my guys and I trust my guys and all that. Um, that's not an issue. And I think when you're playing with a bunch of strangers and you and I understand why they would do it. Um, I but I always find it weird when I've talked to to certain gamers who I, I don't know. It's like they're under the impression that if you're playing on a virtual tabletop, you have to use them as if that's like the only choice that you have and the idea of like you know you can just roll the dice and announce what you got and, but like it's like for them it has to either be all or not like we either have everything on the in the tabletop our character sheets and our dice rolls and our books or we play in person and and i find that really strange of like you can just use as much as that the the, the online system that you need and then not use anything else um, when we do a lot of our, you know, theater of the mind games, like I usually keep it up because as we're playing, I will often throw up pictures of what it is, even if we're not drawing out a, a map. Like we did a, a recent game where, uh, they had to go to Milan in the 1960s during, um, these, these riots during the years of lead. And as I was talking and walking them through the scene, I was dropping photographs of of Milan, Italy, and photographs from the actual riots and everything that happened during then, as just kind of a way of kind of giving him a bit of a visual aid mm -hmm. as I'm talking, and I thought that was that was a really cool thing that that the online system can do. You know, where if, if I have a handout in, in person with the guys, you know, I I make my little newspaper clipping and I hand it to them, and then they slowly pass it around the table. You kind of have to wait for them all to kind of look at it. 
And if it's going to be multiple sessions, inevitably the one person that's like, I'll hold on to it and they stick it in their folder, they're going to have to miss that next session. Now that handout's gone. <laughs> right. um, or yeah, at some point somebody's like, oh, uh, hey, where's the handout? I want to reference it. And they're all looking around and it's because some other player took that handout, they put it on the table, then they put like three books on top of it, and then they put a Coke on top of the books. And and now we're everybody's kind of digging through their stuff, trying to figure out where in the hell that that letter handout went, that telegram handout. And then finally somebody's like, whoops, I stuck it at the bottom of a giant pile of crap for no reason at all. With virtual tabletops, it's awesome because it can be like, and you guys get a handout, and they all get it. Yes, and they can all pull it up later to reference it. You know, so if there's no so and so misplaced it and or hid it from themselves and everybody else, they've all got access to it. Um, I love that feature about it because I'm I'm a handout addict, uh, so I will load them all up and I'll make it really like share with everybody, put it in their journals that way they can reference it whenever they want. You know, boom, there you go, guys, have at it. And there's no more of uh, somebody accidentally hid the handout or it didn't make it around the table. And that one person at the end of the table never got to see the dang thing. And they were the one that had the information that they might've been able to link to little thing, you know, sort of uh, deal where like the reason, like, Oh my God, did you notice that name is the same name as this other person here? That's a link. Um, they might not have actually all read it. So I think it's really cool. You can hit share with all. They're all looking at the handout. And that has been wonderful when it comes to online gaming is we lose the tactile. They don't get to hold yeah. it. But, I, you know, sometimes I just need them to see a picture or I just need them to read the letter. Um, and I, I have found that super useful. Um, also, yeah, I, I don't I, have to dig through my pile of handouts and figure <laughs> out which one it is. <laughs> As a player, sometimes, um, you know, because if I want to re-reference or go back and think about the game between sessions, um, I don't want to have to log into uh, a, a tabletop tool like, you know, Roll20 or something like that just to look at the handouts, you know, right? So I, I've, uh, I have a screen capture uh, tool on my laptop. And so when I'm a player and these handouts get displayed on the screen, I am quickly doing a screen cap and saving it locally. I, so do I can just <laughs> reference it whenever I want without having to, you know, get into an app, you know, an app of some sort and, uh, and do that. No. And, and, and I do that too. Cause I mean, we have used so many different ways of playing online, whether it's on this system or this system, or just do it on regular old Discord or Zoom or, you know, Teams or, you know, all the different stuff. So whenever the, the GM has uh, shown us the handout, maybe they're just doing a share screen or something. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I'll print screen that and, and, and save that and have a little file for that game. That way I can go back and, and reference it because, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's just me. Um, and I'm so happy to know somebody else does that because I thought maybe <laughs> I was a little flower and that nobody else did that because uh, it feels that way. But, you know, I, I have loved that aspect about it is now everybody's got the handout. Uh, everybody can reference it. And that's, that's a huge plus. And just another big plus of online gaming is let's just go ahead and, and, and admit to the, the, the biggest is that we had to play with all sorts of people from around the freaking world. That's that true. There is no chance in hell I would have gotten to play with ever. Um, so whenever like with the, the, how we roll guys, you know, they're, they're in the UK and yeah, know, then, you know, another one's in Georgia and, you know, we're spread out across God knows how many time zones and we're all playing together and it's, it's great when you get to play with them because you just due to, you know, time zones to them, it's the evening, but to me, it's like two in the afternoon. So like, you know, the, sometimes I do look at the time. It's like, my God, it's like three in the morning for them. How are they still plugging away? And like, <laughs> so finally, they're like, okay, guys, I'm going to go to bed. It's like, okay, guys, I'm going to go uh, make pizza and uh, have dinner. And it's like, it's like, ah, oh, winter. But 
you know, so I've gotten to play with so many great people from around the world. It, that just would not have been possible. One of our players moved away. He moved to Colorado during the pandemic. He just kept on playing with us. It was no different for us uh, when, when he had changed. So that I think is to me, the biggest value is it just opens up the the doors and the possibilities of who we get to to play with now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, you know, not just, uh, people from around, around the world, but it's people, you know, from all across the United States. And so I'm able to, to play in games, you know, with, uh, the into the darkness crew. And there's a lot of players who are, in east coast time there's you know players on pacific time you know there's a player in england uh, scotland actually and uh and so yeah it's it's awesome to be able to have all these people from all over the world able to play in a single game together and and it run well oh yeah now it sounds like if you're doing a lot of uh, uh, VTTs, virtual tabletops. So, are you playing a lot with cameras? Are you doing a lot of FaceTime gaming, or or do you play uh, audio only? Uh, we'll, we'll do uh, cameras at, at all possible. Mostly, it's, you get the interpersonal stuff, like expressions and mm -hmm. and and that sort of thing. I, you know, I I will do audio only if if i absolutely have to uh so i have done it but i prefer the camera i like to see um i'm you know i talk with my hands i'm very expressive and i, and I can read especially if i'm a game master because i can tell if i'm losing them i can tell if they're confused you know that's you know, so much of uh for me being a gm also has to deal with being able to like see their faces which that's also been a big benefit. When I'm sitting around a table, if I'm looking at the guy on my left, I cannot see the person to my right. I can't see, you know, any expression going on with them. Versus now, I've got my my wall of monitors uh, or little windows of their faces, so I can't. They're all right there. They're all right there, and I know for a fact they're surfing the internet. Uh, but I can, <laughs> I can, I can see them, and and I can, I can read those expressions. They can read each other's. So. Uh, for us, we we use cameras if if it's possible for us to. So, you know, when this really kind of started becoming a thing for me, uh, which even predates uh, the pandemic, I was more of a just an audio only because I I actually thought that that's what would be a lower barrier of entry. For people, I thought I could get more players if I advertised, hey, let's just play audio only, right? You know, use your own real dice, have pen and paper uh, character sheets that you've made, uh, you know, and I'm a, I don't know if I'm a just a trusting game master or just apathetic, but I am not micromanaging anybody's roles. If they roll something and they tell me get, they got a certain result, I believe you. There's, I'm not going to give you an argument because I'm of the mindset that however that player is playing, that's what's fun for them. And as long as their mode of fun is not negatively impacting the other players, I'm all for it, you know? And I find that games can be as fun, maybe if more fun, with uh, chaos and failure than you know constant oh. you know successes right yeah our our, our the, the stories that we, i love telling and the stories that we love recounting usually involve some ridiculous level of failure uh, oh yeah uh, none of our stories are and we came up with a plan and it worked flawlessly and we were we were right. home in time for dinner no it is always like it was supposed to be so damn simple but then the dice did this thing and nice. it, it, it was a comedy of errors as we are trying to not have the plan come crashing down around us because it was at that moment chaos happened. Um, you know, with my, with my group, I, I, I fully trust them and I wouldn't play with them if I didn't fully trust them. So if they want to roll online, 
they can. Um, you know, some, sometimes they will, I guess maybe because like they're, they couldn't find a die fast enough or something, but normally we were tactile. So I'll have my dice tower set up next to me. Uh, so many times somebody be like, Oh my God, if they hold something like amazing and they'll like grab the camera off the top of their computer, or lift up mm-hmm. their, their laptop to show us the dice. So it gets the shaky cam, like it's a Blair witch thing. Right. It, <laughs> it all of a sudden like. It, and it's never quite in focus. So then it's kind of like kind of zooming in and out of focus as their hands are yeah. shaking. As they're you like, just yell, you just yell, yeah, that looks great. Put your thing down now. Yeah. Um, and and I, I also fully trust my players because if they weren't being honest with their dice rolls, there is no way a cheater would fail as bad as they do uh, because they, man, they love rolling double lots and Call of Cthulhu like constantly. So if, if, if that's them kind of flubbing their dice and giving me a better, better results than they normally have, I don't want to know yeah. <laughs> how bad they really roll. Um, but you know, that's, that's what we like doing. Um, and, yeah, I, but that's because I we're have, existing players. Yeah. You know, I, I have been migrating from an audio only to, uh, to having a camera format. Cause as you said, being able to see faces and expressions and just there is some level of body language, you know, inaudible body language that you are able to emote facially through the camera. So, you know, in the online games that I'm playing, we are playing with cameras, but I'm not usually in games with a structured virtual tabletop system that has, you know, battle maps with uh source lighting and fog of war and you know i I, i'm not playing those games you know we're we're playing theater of the mind but we have cameras so we can see each other's faces and you know and i encourage people to roll real dice um and we just simply use you know these uh uh voip you know voice over ip systems uh as a as a way to connect and be able to see each other but i don't really need the technology to do more than that and then you know and then of course you know the sharing of digital handouts i mean that's that's a, a big bonus but when it comes to to maps you know the first thing i do is if i'm writing the game is i disable the grid um uh, and, and, the, and the grid movement and and all of that one of the things that does drive me bats with roll 20 is um, you know you can have where their icons have their names, but you can only see the name if you have control of the icon. So it's all like many on the board. Everybody has full control over everything because I want them to be able to see the name tags for NPCs or for each other, uh, which means that they could they could move each other if they like. But uh, so even when like um, you know we were doing a lot of traveler and we've got like the deck plans for the ship and they're running around because there's you know spider monsters on board or something um you know it i treat it like call it cthulhu maps we're like distance is squishy guys uh you know we're not doing it where it's like you move six squares and your your weapon has a range of 12 squares or or whatnot it's just yeah it looks like it looks like the right distance let's just let's just do it and i have i found that the uh the the, the systems because they kind of default to grid movement and all that it it adds that i don't know it's like kind of that retro war game feel like old school games where you you were moving a certain number of squares and i haven't done that in so dang long that it it's like what is this the 90s uh so i i disable all that um you know at home whenever i've got my map it, yeah there's a grid because it came on it and two the grid helps me keep my lines straight because otherwise i have the artistic ability of a drunk three-year-old so i need that grid to like keep my my rooms remotely kind of rectangular uh otherwise it just looks like you know some sort of just horrible dolly painting of like melty walls um and we might count squares to kind of like how far is that? It's like, ah, it's about that far. And then the last like, how long is a square? It's like, eh, somewhere between three and five feet. You know, like, what are you trying to do? And, but I, I wish I could, I wish I was the only one that could see them. But, you know, so with online, that's the first thing I do is disable that crap because I don't want 
it to feel like we're counting squares or, or something like that. Um, one, one of my guys that we've been playing Cyberpunk Red online, and that's a system that is actually designed around grid. It's, you know, one of my complaints about it is it's really grid movement based. Mm-hmm. It is so freaking weird when we're trying to move our little icons and they only move in these right angles and, you know, across, you know, the, the, the grid that's laid down over it, that I just find it so weird uh, yeah. to do it that way. Because even when we used them with miniatures, I didn't require that the miniature always be in the exact center of each square. We were always like, just try to get it in one. But if, you know, the stand is hat like going over onto another, just make sure most of your mini is in the square your character's in and we'll call it a day. Uh, so I, I think a lot of people go to that because it's often the default setting on those systems. Um, and they're like, oh, well, I guess that's how I'm supposed to use it. And meanwhile, I'm like going through the tutorial going like, how do I disable all this crap? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I want it as dumb as I can get it because um, like I said, we'll do theater of the mind or I'll throw down a map and they will have icons that can move it around, but it's like how I normally use them on a board where it's like, oh, so-and-so is in that room. Just move their thing in that room. Cool. And now everybody has a visual res rep like reminder that so-and-so's characters in that room, but they don't have to be you know, up next to the bed and the bookcase because that's what they're checking out. They just really need to be in that room and they're visual cues. So I've, I've liked that. Like I said, I've loved the, the uh, fog of war feature and the dynamic lighting feature when they work and dynamic lighting can take up a lot of my prep time. And I don't want to be wasting my prep time, uh, getting cool shadow effects when I could be preparing the game so I can run it smoother and I can add a lot more to it. And a, a lot of GMs, you know, there's only so much time they have. And if they're using up a significant part of their prep time into getting these special effects to work, then that's time that they don't have anymore to be getting the adventure down pat, to getting all their stuff uh, ready to roll. That way, when, when the game starts, they can run that smoothly. And when the players throw a curve bar ball at them, they can adapt quicker because they've got it down versus always having to, to check the adventure to see how the basics are working versus right. I'm usually checking the adventure to figure out like, whoa, how can I possibly keep this <laughs> working at all? Uh, because I don't think any game writer could have predicted this. Um, so, and I, I think it, some people do get a little obsessed with the bells and whistles that they might lose some of the, what, what it's really about. Yep. I agree. You know, the, the, the one thing that, uh, has been also a, a major boon, uh, for online role-playing like this and the media is inherently recordable and there has been an, an explosion of these recorded game sessions put out on youtube uh for for fans to watch and enjoy like they're watching uh you know a television series you know and I mean, I do it. I, there are shows, there there are, you know, uh, actual play uh, games that I'll watch and it's fun. It, you know, if you can get the right uh, crew of players, get the right game. And of course, it's all subjective. I mean, you know, what I find entertaining to watch, somebody else may not and, and vice versa. But there are a ton of these things available online for people to consume. Well, it, it not just as entertainment. Um, they're they're also very very popular for uh, GMs prepping a certain adventure. So if they're like wanting to see like, well, how could I run you know Curse of Strahd or Mister Corbett or whatever, it or this particular part because this particular part makes me like I don't know how it's supposed to work. A lot of times you you'll have GMs as part of their prep go out and find actual plays. Um, just to see how it was handled or get or, or mine ideas 
uh, you know, part of like when I do my game reviews, I always talk about their firsthand accounts. So I'm giving you my experienced uh, suggestions, uh, many of which I came up with after the game was over. And I was reflecting, how the hell could I make this? You know, could I have done this better? Um, so they'll they'll watch an actual play of either the whole thing or part of it, and they can get the I see where that worked. I can get a cool idea from it, or I can see how I could improve that uh, by by seeing like, well, this they did it rules you know as written for that scenario, and just seeing how that actually does play out versus when you're reading it, that can sometimes give them that idea of like, okay. I got a way I can make that better, you know, either because it wasn't good and they're going to make it work or it was good. But now that I've seen how it work, I can improve this and make it cooler. Um, and that's been a valuable resource for a lot of GMs. Uh, I, I, you do kind of find it, you know, might be a bit of a time sink if they're having to go through a, a 10 hours worth of live plays before they run an adventure. But yeah, if they're enjoying it, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Yep. The, uh, and not only are, are fans, you know, recording these and, and putting them out, but conventions, well-established conventions are now running sometimes uh, in tandem with their with their live convention, uh, like GaryCon. GaryCon is going to have live GaryCon and ethereal GaryCon running at the exact same time. I like ethereal. That's a good choice of. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that was that like was that. a that was a nice uh, nice little marketing thing that came out. I like with. that. Good, um, good, good call, guys. Good call, exactly. Uh, but a lot of these, you know, uh, well established and, and and even brand new uh, uh, game conventions are having uh, an online only option. And it, that helps, obviously, with the, the pandemic that we're in. But I think this is a trend that we're going to see ongoing because this allows people to uh, gather, just like we you know pointed out earlier, people from all over the world can, can get together online and play. This will allow people uh, from all over the world to get a sample, a taste of these uh, conventions here in Kansas City. There's a uh, gaming club uh, called uh, uh, the Midwest uh, Gamers, and so they have a they have a convention called the Midwest Game Fest, and there's a live convention in November, but they just started um, a digital only convention that's going to be in March. The very first one this year will be in March. And uh, I'm going to be one of the uh, guests of honor for this online convention. So I'm going to be running online games. I'm going to be part of online panels. It's just going to be a four day online, you know, game convention uh, for this uh, Midwest Game Fest. And I mean, this is going to be something that's going to stick around. I, I feel oh, like, yeah. you know, Gary Khan and their ethereal Gary Khan, that's a thing that will stick around. Oh yeah, I I, I think as uh, the, the the pandemic, you know, winds down, you know, God willing, goes away. Um, it's not like you know the, the the gates have been opened, and a lot of uh, cons uh, have 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 already kind of established this is how we're going to do it. Uh, a lot more people of the the consumer base this is what they've gotten used to you know they've all got sign-ins now they've all got the basic understandings of how this works you know the hard part with the a, a new technology is usually getting people to learn the new technology well uh i th we we basically got got forced to accelerate the what that natural progression of getting people to learn it would have been so you know Gates are opened, you know, Pandora's box is, it's unleashed. This is not going away. And, and I think as, as it goes, people are going to come up with cooler ideas, better ways of doing it. And I think it is just ultimately going to get better. Now, I don't ever foresee a universe in which I think I would ultimately prefer that over playing in person with my friends. 
but I, I think the uh, all the features and all the technologies and all all of that are going to make it a lot better. And I think it's going to give us a lot of cool stuff that playing a person can't match uh, or can't do. Um, where it's it's got its own benefits that impersonal will never be able to touch. So I, I think this is just always going to be a thing. So I think there's always going to be an ethereal Gary Khan and the, the, the online gen cons. I think every, every one of them is going to have that. And we're seeing um, probably going to see a lot more of the purely virtual cons uh, because a lot of them popped up during that time. Uh, Chaosium just ran last weekend, last Saturday, impromptu con four which was just a hey let's let's do something over this weekend and and they call it impromptu con because they give next to no notice about it like maybe just a few days and they're like hey we're gonna run a con this weekend if anybody wants to play come on online join us on discord yeah and so i think this is you know you know flash mob sort of cons i think that's going to be uh, just normal and I think that everyone's just going to have to get used to it. Uh, but at the same time, I think the virtual tabletop platforms are only going to get better. I think all of it is only going to Im improve and, and make it a lot easier is different ones are probably going to cater to different needs. So I'm, you know, you kind of you got to evolve. So I, I yeah. think I, I, it's one of those I'm always going to now be aware of it i'm not going to hesitate to do it uh but with my buddies i'm still going to try to play in person <laughs> exactly. exactly but we still do have like weeknight games like our side games we will do online because it's thursday night you know i'm not going to make them drive across the dallas metroplex to do a three-hour game after they just got off a day of work but those are for the side games yep this was awesome this was a good uh Good show. Yeah, well, we had a lot more to talk about on that one than I thought we were. We, <laughs> evidently, I could not judge how much we can ramble on a subject. <laughs> we are good at opening mouths and putting out words, so there you go. <laughs> well, we want to thank our patrons uh, for your support. This show, just it cannot be done without your support, and we really do thank you. If you want to become a patron, please uh, go to our site, patron.com forward slash Modern Mythos will have a link in the show notes. Thank you, guys. And we cannot do this show alone. Uh, I want to thank our amazing editors, Max Mahaffa and Edward Nagy, for their hard work and keen skills at making us sound awesome and deleting the parts where John and I stare at each other in our cameras kind of awkwardly uh, so it, you don't have the dead air like when I'm running my buddy and I ask him to make a dice roll and there's 20 <laughs> seconds of dead air. <laughs> It just the sound of ecstasy of gold is playing in the background. <laughs> we also want to thank John Sumro for our super badass logo. He is an incredibly talented artist, so please follow him on Facebook. Check out his official website and consider becoming a patron for him as well. We will have links in the show notes for him. And finally, we want to thank the darkest of the hillside thickets for generously allowing us to use their song Gluttony as our intro and outro music. If you're a fan of Lovecraft's writing and the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, then you need to check out the darkest of the hillside thickets. Please check out their Bandcamp site and their official band site. Links below in the show notes. And on a side note, you would not believe who recommended that I should listen to the darkest of the hillside thickets a couple of weeks ago. Who's that? Sandy Peterson. <laughs> hand to god uh, so we, we were having a dinner and we we're talking about something but just like well you're familiar with darkest of the hillside thickets and it's like you know sandy this is nothing i would have ever expected to come out of your mouth before so uh if they are listening uh they should know that yes the, the great old one himself has has been listening to them <laughs> way to go sandy seth i had a great time i did too I want to thank all you listeners. Thank you so much. We'll see you in our next episode.